easy to see. What is a Bitcoin? Most of the people in this room don't know, including myself. And, uh, we have brought in our own expert, Muni uh, Ali from Princeton University, a PhD student, who is here to share his wisdom. Bitcoin is made simple. Is this better? Yeah. Okay, so uh, first, a, first a little background on me. Uh, my re I think I started my PhD at Princeton in 2008. My research area is distributed systems, which means that I deal with really large scale systems like data centers or computer networking, also kind of falls under that. So I was mostly doing research at Princeton in these areas until last summer when I discovered Bitcoin. And things have never been the same again. <laughs> so for starters, all of my money is in Bitcoin. I, my wife is sitting right there, and she is completely not sure what I'm doing with my life. Uh, I actually cash out two dollars whenever I need to on a per day, per week basis. I don't do not recommend people to do that this week. Uh, I was about to wrap up my PhD thesis, and I stopped working on it. My thesis is now in Bitcoins. Uh, if you're a sixth year PhD student, I do not recommend that you do that. <laughs> and finally, um, I started a Bitcoin company. So we are actually trying to commercialize some of the stuff related to Bitcoins. So with that background, so yeah, I am a PhD candidate at Princeton, about to wrap up, hopefully soon, that's my that's what my wife is praying for here. <laughs> and I have a startup with another uh, Princeton alumni, Ryan Shea, from the class of 2012. So in this talk, I'm going to talk about uh, how Bitcoin started, what it really is, what people think it is, so that's the common misconceptions part. Uh, how not to invest in Bitcoin, I can tell you a lot of ways how not to do it. I, I don't know how to really do that, but at least I can warn you of how not to do it. And uh, finally, a glimpse into the future, because a lot of people think of Bitcoin as a currency. Uh, what's really exciting is that Bitcoin is also a, a revolutionary new technology, and we haven't seen the effects of that yet. And I, I would really like to talk a lot more about that. Uh, again, a disclaimer, all views are my own. They don't represent Princeton or my startup at all. Whatever I'm saying, you know, the bad advice I'm giving is coming from me. And uh, second thing is, this is not an investment advice. Uh, one thing I've noticed over the past few months is that because I'm really passionate about Bitcoin, I talk to people at like, you know, we can have a cocktail party or something like that, and I'm talking to them, and they get really excited, and they buy their first Bitcoins the next day. And then, then Bitcoin crashes, and they come back. <laughs> so this is not an investment advice, do not buy Bitcoins after this talk. Uh, how many people have seen this recently? So it was on the cover of Newsweek. Right? So they completely got it wrong, by the way. There's absolutely no way it's that guy. Right? Uh, but, but just one of the reasons is that, so I've been doing research in distributed systems for like close to 10 years now. I, I, I spent some time in research centers after doing under the app. And I haven't seen anything as elegantly designed as Bitcoin ever. Not even the internet itself. Right, so thinking that one guy who used to work for the government for part time or something like that sat in his basement and came up with Bitcoin, it, it's just not possible. Bitcoin requires expertise in computer security, distributed systems, that's my area. Um, and uh, you need to be a great programmer in C, C++. You don't see a lot of them anymore. Uh, it needs expertise in game theory and in economics. Because most probably actually not even a single guy. It's, it's a group of researchers who decided to, to you know, not publish their name, which is a common practice in computer security. You would see a lot of computer security protocols where they would just need to use pseudonyms. So I think this is what happened. Most probably the research group was led by computer security researchers, but they definitely had help from other, uh, a lot of other research areas as well. So Bitcoin 
creator Satoshi Nakamoto is, in my view, most probably not a single person. Right? And you probably wouldn't even find out who he really is. He was definitely not that guy. Uh, so it started in late 2008, roughly when I started my PhD. Oh, I wish I had discovered Bitcoin then. They were cheap. Uh, just some basic facts. There's supposed to be 21 million coins in total, and that's a hard limit. And that's the reason why people sometimes compare Bitcoin to gold. Because there is a finite amount of gold <coughs> on the planet, and that's why uh, you know the people assign certain value to gold. They say there's in intrinsic value in gold, and because there's a finite amount, it's not that someone can just like sit in their house and come up with more gold. So you can have some guarantees on why uh, the price is what it is. Similarly with Bitcoin, there is a hard upper limit. There will never be more than 21 million coins in circulation. That does not mean that uh, you will not be able to spend money because Bitcoin is actually divisible. Just like you have cents, the smallest unit in a Bitcoin is called a Satoshi. And there are 100 million Satoshis in a single Bitcoin. Right, so there will be plenty of money around, even if Bitcoin takes over all other currencies. So one, one theory that I have for why they actually picked that number is that if you looked at all of uh, forex markets in the world, if Bitcoin actually takes over all of them, then one Satoshi would be equal to a dollar. So th that's, that, that's like one rough guess I have, but why they picked that number. <coughs> Uh, just like governments issue, you know, the US government issues dollars and they can control how much money is in circulation, in Bitcoin the protocol actually decides how much money is in circulation. And no one, no one controls the protocol, that's the beauty of it. It's completely decentralized. There's no single um, institution, third party, any individual that can influence the protocol. It, think of it more like a autonomous system that it just lives, it gives other people incentives to do certain things, but it kind of like has life of its own. And the protocol decides that every, let's say, 10 minutes is going to release a little bit of money into the system, right? And this will keep happening until, I would say, 90 more years, until finally we run out. And I'll talk about what will, what will happen when we run out more uh, Bitcoins. But currently we have around like 12 million of them in circulation today. Uh, one of the reasons why normal people, by normal I mean non-geeks, know about Bitcoin is because the price last year, so re remember Bitcoin started in 2008, no one noticed it till last year. Because the price was in certain sense, you know, only like computer nerds would use it, and then suddenly something happened and the price went to all the way up to 30. And then there was the first Bitcoin crash that not a lot of people heard about. It went from 30 to 135, and then crashed all the way back to 30. And then there was the second Bitcoin bubble. This has been uh, mainly because when China, uh, a lot of people in China started buying Bitcoins. At that time, the price went up again from 30 all the way to 1,200. And you would see media going crazy, that there is now this new computer currency that everyone's buying, and this was the best investment you could have made in 2013, and so on, and then the price crashed again. Uh, I think today is around 430 or something like that. I wouldn't be surprised if it goes down even more. Uh, what is more exciting is this last line over here, that uh, just in the last year or a little more, there has been more than $200 million worth of hardcore tech investments into technology behind Bitcoin. And that's the part that I'm most excited about, and I'll, I'll talk more about that. So if, if you look at this curve, I don't know where we are on the curve right now. It could be we're still here. It could be that the last crash of China brought us down here, and then maybe we're stabilized. But I cannot wait until we reach this point. Right? When people stop talking about the price of Bitcoin, they stop talking about how much money can I make off Bitcoin and just start using it with some sort of uh, stable price. So misconceptions. First, people think that Bitcoin is like fake money or they use the word virtual, which I don't like. Virtual kind of gives you the impression that it's not 
real. It's, it doesn't exist. It exists as much as your bank account exists. Most people interact with your banks online these days, right? It's just a number there that hey, you have $20,000 in, in your bank account. So the word I normally use is digital currency. Even, even, even that is not, a, not the, the perfect word. Uh, we're still looking for it. The second thing is you hear a lot about, oh, it's a Ponzi scheme, right? Um, the first thing about a Ponzi scheme is someone should benefit from it, right? In Bitcoin, it's highly unclear. Is it, is it the computer protocol that is just going to get richer? I mean, it's, it's not a person. Um, and and on, on the other end of the spectrum, people think that it's a ticket to get rich quick. Right? And that is also absolutely wrong. Sure, there are price fluctuations. Uh, the best way to think about Bitcoin is it's a technology and there's a technology adoption curve. Just like in 1994 or 95, there weren't any email users. And by 2000, there were more email users. By 2005, there were even more. Bitcoin is a technology that is slowly gaining adoption. Right? And the more users there are, for some reason, it kind of correlates with price. All the price should stabilize. Uh, at some point in the future. Uh, so this is what I get a lot. Bitcoin is not secure, and then people cite Mt. Gox. How many people know what Mt. Gox is? Okay. So a lot of people know. So uh, Mt. Gox was the first and the largest exchange, and it was also run by some of the most technically inept people I've seen. <laughs> so it, it, it started off as uh, there were some P PHP program. PHP is this language you write like um, websites and, and and a lot of really good programmers don't like using that language. Um, it was it was a website written in PHP where some geeks were trading online cards for this game called Magic the Online Gathering, right? And they they had some sort of trading system built in for exchanging cards, and they started accepting bitcoins. And at at some point, someone was like, "Let's put two and two together. We have." Uh, an exchange mechanism, and we already accept Bitcoins. Let's turn this website around and make it into a Bitcoin exchange. And they went through trouble uh, months after months, years after years, until they were holding something like one billion dollars worth of Bitcoins, even more, and then they lost uh, most of them. So I, I don't really know what happened. What I do know is that um, almost every other month, there was something or the other that went wrong that Mt. Gox actually found me dead. Um, I think I was up late at night. Um, I actually took a screenshot of the last heartbeat of Mt. Gox when the price <laughs> stopped and their servers finally choked. <laughs> okay, so what is Bitcoin then? I think it's, it's two different things really. And what, what everyone usually hears about is, is this thing. Bitcoin the currency, right? And what's more important, at least in my view, is Bitcoin the protocol, Bitcoin the technology. And I'm, I'm going to talk more about that. Why? Why is the technology more important? First of all, I get into a lot of arguments with people where they're like, "You can't just start a new currency," or "How can you have a currency that is not go that is not backed by government?" Right? And 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 after many many debates. This is like one example I came up with that uh, some people find interesting. Let's see how it goes. So, so let's say today in this room, I say, uh, let's start a new currency. How would we do that? Right? Everyone sitting in this room, or let's say it's the CS department, uh, where we are like, okay, let's just design a new currency and see how it works. Right? So it might uh, look something like this. So the currency is both a medium of, ex of exchange and store of value. What I mean by that is, I should be able to buy things with it. Like, you know, you don't want to go back to the days where I will exchange a piece of metal and you will give me some sort of service. But everything translates to, let's say, dollars, and then you can buy other things with dollars. So it's a medium of exchange. Also, it's a store of value. Just like if you buy property or you're making investments, you can also just store money and have some sort of guarantee that over, over the years you will be able to uh, get that value back. And then usually, you know, uh, it, it, there is some sort of central authority that kind of regulates. So this is a professor at Princeton. I don't know how many people are familiar with Brian Carnegie. Uh, he, he wrote a book uh, on C, C++, and uh, so he's a he's a famous professor in our department. Let's say we decide to start our own currency, and there are only 
20 units in it. Let's call them coins. Right? I decide to keep 10 of them, and I give 10 to Brian. And that's it. This, we, what we do is we have a piece of paper, and we write down that, hey, Brian, you have 10 coins, and I have 10 coins. And this is our currency. Let's say Paul Krugman decides that this is a very interesting experiment. Uh, I also want to join. And uh, he says, how much money do I have? You don't have any. Right? So let's write down on the piece of paper that you have zero coins. Now Paul is like, okay, what do I need to do to get some of this new currency? And I'm like, well, maybe you can write me a good recommendation or something, and I'll give you. <laughs> uh, so, so, so notice what's going on here. This is stable. There's a piece of paper, and it's, it's kind of like a ledger. And now I'm sending a transaction out. I'm saying, I'm giving you two coins, but it's not really confirming me, right? So there are only three people in this scenario, so we just ask each other. Brian is like, hey, Paul, did you really get the money? He's like, yeah, I got it. It's like, okay, everyone agrees that he sent the money? And I was like, yeah. Okay, so it gets confirmed, and now see the balance over here changes, right? So I was at 10 points, there was this transaction, and now it changes, 8 and 2. Great, I think my job is done. You all know about Bitcoin. <laughs> okay, but jokes aside, you really know about Bitcoin. This is literally all Bitcoin is. There is a file, and it's, it's a list of transactions. And instead of using paper, actually, let me, let me, let me expand this. <clears throat> Let's say, uh, so my wife, she works for Google. She told Larry Page about this. He's like, I'm interested in this new currency. Uh, what can I do? He's like, OK, Larry, you have zero coins. The only difference is all of us were at Princeton, but he's sitting in Mountain View. And now he also wants to play. Okay. Uh, do, do you see the problem here? That we just had a piece of paper, which was a ledger. Now someone sitting on the other side of the continent wants to be a part of it. Right. So what do we do? Do we create two copies of that piece of paper? How would we make sure that the balances are exactly the same? And this, this was the exact problem that Bitcoin had to solve. But how can you design a ledger that would reflect exactly the same values for everyone in the world. Right? So, so Larry, in this system, if I'm sending him two coins, uh, would need some sort of a distributed ledger. Right? And this is the technology that I keep referring to, that actually powers Bitcoin. Right? In, in Bitcoin speak, it's called the blockchain. But you should really think of it as a ledger which has the same value no matter where you are in the world. And you don't need any, anyone uh, to actually uh, be some sort of a trusted third party. You don't need Bank of America to keep the locks. Right? The protocol just keeps them and gives, gives everyone a guarantee that the values there are actually what they are. And no one is trying to steal money. And no one is trying to you know, send false transactions. So how, how is this implemented? I know that you know, uh, I'm not talking to a tech audience, so I'm just going to keep it extremely simple. But I would really like people to get a visual understanding of how Bitcoin works. Think of it as the, this blockchain, the ledger, is it just a file. It's literally just a file. You know, the size attached to it, I think last time I downloaded it, it was 18 gigabytes or something. Like that. And it has all transactions ever done <coughs> on the Bitcoin network. Right. <coughs> And if it grows as you make more transactions, let's say that I now want to uh, tip the nice people who were you know, serving us nice cocktails earlier, and I send them a Bitcoin, it will basically just add that transaction at the end of the file. So it's a file that keeps growing, it's just a log, and they will just log everything. And then that's, now you really know how Bitcoin works. Uh, let's, let's get into consensus. <laughs> so the problem here is, what if someone comes up with a new file and says, this is the real Bitcoin blockchain, uh, you actually owe me 100 Bitcoins. So in, in this example, uh, I'm like, 
what, what happens if, let's say, someone breaks a glass in this room and then says it wasn't me? Right? Most people would point and say, no, it actually was you. And at some point, there would be consensus in the room, usually depending on uh, if the majority of the people are saying something. That's right. right? So if, let's say, 95% of the people are saying, no, that was really you, I saw you, you broke the glass, then the general understanding is, yes, you broke the glass. Similarly, in this currency, the majority wins. Right? To be precise, uh, you need to have 51% of the votes to be able to decide what's the right balance on the blockchain. Right? So if there is any kind of disagreement when somebody is trying to send transactions that never really happened, they would have to take over the majority of the network to be able to lie. Right? And that's, that, that, that's kind of like an important thing to understand. Uh, so what that means is that the larger the Bitcoin network, the harder it gets for people to attack it. Right? And given the current size of the Bitcoin network, you need the computing power of the top 500 supercomputers multiplied by 200 to be able to lie on the network. And that's not really bad anytime soon. So if we replace this with computers now, so it's, it's the exact same thing. One period is like, hey, I just sent you some money. Did you get it? This is the evil one. It's, it's a Windows. See that? Uh, no, I didn't. Uh, no, you did. And if everybody else agrees, then that transaction goes through. right? So 51% is, is the magic number. Uh, so how it happens in real life is whenever there is any form of voting, first you have to prove that I'm a human. Right? When, when, you, when, you, when you, it's election time and you're actually going to vote, you bring some sort of a ID with you right, to prove that yes, I'm a citizen and I can vote. If it's something online, have people have solved those CAPTCHAs online? So it's basically a Turing test. Turing, by the way, was also from Princeton, 1930s. Uh, there's a Turing test that asks them, are you human? Prove it. And then you prove I'm a human, they're like, OK, yeah, you can create this account because you're a human. Similarly, in, in, for Bitcoin, the protocol asks them, the computers, are you a computer? So it's like a reverse Turing test. So the computer first needs to prove, uh, yes, I'm a computer. And if it proves I'm a computer, then it can vote. So this thing about mining that you keep hearing about, that people are mining money or something like that, it's basically just this thing happening, that these computers are given a hard puzzle to solve, it says that, I won't get into the details, it's like a hashing algorithm. And then they are constantly proving, yes, I'm a computer, yes, I'm a computer, yes, I'm a computer. And once they can prove they're a computer, then they get a vote on the network. Right? And depending on how many computers there are, uh, if more than 51% agree on something, that's the balance on the balance sheet. Right? And that, that's how the protocol works. Uh, this is just a visual way. This is the distributed ledger, exactly like how in our currency that it was a piece of paper that has everyone's balances and the transactions on it. And these computers are basically just saying, I'm a computer, I'm a computer. Let's say these four agree on something, and that transaction goes through. And it seems to work perfectly fine for the past more than five years, but there are actually mathematical guarantees behind how Bitcoin is a really secure protocol and how it works. So the, the, this thing about Bitcoin not being secure, we should really differentiate uh, between the computational properties of the system or the mathematical guarantees behind it versus tools available for to people for how they manage their security. Right? So Bitcoin is actually a system that is way more secure than other online services people are used to, but we, we just don't have the right tools rolled out yet that people can easily use and then keep their coins secure. Somewhere. So it will take a couple of years but, but just remember that there's a huge difference between what's practically available out there in the market right now and what are the mathematical foundations on which something is built. Again, okay, going back to mining. Uh, so this network I talked about, it, it basically resyncs every 10 minutes. That's why people say that it takes 10 minutes to send a transaction. So everyone is sending out transactions. Every 10 minutes, they're like, OK, this is the next state of the ledger. And here, protocol, the protocol gets really clever. 
it gives people the incentive to plug their computers to the network. And the way it does that, that every 10 minutes is actually printing new money and giving it out. Right. And, and that's the mining process. It's, it's actually becoming almost like an industry. There are data centers, which are these like stacks of computers, like almost like factories of computers, <coughs> which all they're doing is mining for the Bitcoin network. Because they have some probability that every 10 minutes you get more Bitcoins. Right. If, if, if my computer got it, uh, today the rate is 25. So if a Bitcoin is worth $450, you can do the calculation, it's actually a lot of money. Right. So you're burning electricity, you're providing a server service to the protocol, and then the protocol gives you rewards. There will be enough people already using Bitcoins that there will be enough transactions that, that just the transaction fees will be a high enough incentive for people to keep running those computers. Right, and, and you won't have to worry about it for the next like 90 to 100 years anyway. So this is a chart that everyone kind of sees and gets excited by. Um, and it, it kind of correlates nicely when I started my PhD. So Bitcoin was here, right? some sense. And then it stayed here for a very, very, very long time. And this was the first um, bubble that I talked about. This was uh, April of last year when it went to 135, crashed all the way down. This looks very similar to this, just on a smaller scale. Right? And this is where I basically converted everything I had to Bitcoins. <laughs> and I was so happy here. <laughs> and then this happened. Right, so, um, Again, coming to the investment part of it, you might buy, I know people who bought hair and then sold the hair, yeah. right? So you, you don't want to do that. This is really <laughs> <laughs> like you, once, once you have a significant enough um, uh, foot in the game, then you're checking the price like every 10 minutes or something, right? And then uh, you freak out and then there are all sorts of news. Think of it this way that that this is the wild, wild the best right, right? Nobody knows how to regulate Bitcoin. Regulations are changing all the time. There are different countries which are entering the ecosystem and then they decide that maybe we don't want to be a part of it. Um, so, so a lot is going on, right? It's, it's, it's not going to stabilize anytime soon. What I want to point out is I'm going to represent the same graph using a different scale and then explain what that is. So it's the exact same graph. This time, it's in log scale. Right? Looks much smoother, right? Looks much more like any technology adoption curve. If it's the number of Facebook users going, it's going up, let's say it was only at Harvard, and then it came to Princeton or something like that, right? And then uh, people didn't pay attention, there was a news article or something like that, and then more people signed up. Right? This looks much more scary. <laughs> but if you think of Bitcoin as just like uh, it's 1994 or 95, and only, uh, by the way, less than a million people actually own Bitcoin right now. Less than a million people. So it's like saying that less than a million people have email addresses and they actively use email. So in, in 10 years from now, like if this was 97 and someone was telling Bank of America, do you want to send me my, my bank statements over email? They'll be like, what are you talking about? Like, like, uh, like what is email? A, B, why would we ever do that? Similarly, if you go to Bank of America today and you're like, hey, um, can I actually keep my Bitcoins at your bank? It'll be the same thing. A, what are you talking about? B, why would I ever do that? Um, yeah, moving on to uh, Bitcoin investment. First of all, never invest in anything you can't afford to lose. It obviously doesn't apply to me, but uh, <laughs> this, is, this is like the three points I came to after talking to a lot of people. So what I tell them is that treat it like a trip to Vegas or something. It's a gamble. There is a, there's a 30, 40% chance everything can go to zero. Right? The number can crash, you know, maybe some government can decide. So it would require an investment between one to two billion dollars to actually take over the Bitcoin network. Right? It's not unthinkable. 
if a government wants to really shut it down, they need to buy like two billion dollars worth of computers, plug them all to the Bitcoin network, and then just try to take them Can't happen. Uh, so, yeah, don't invest in anything you can't afford to lose. The second thing is, if you are really investing, do not look at the price in the short term. Okay? Think of it as, in terms of forex markets, uh, the the Bitcoin has a market cap of, of, at its peak, it had a market cap of $10 billion. That's not even the currency of Iceland. Right? So if internet becomes anything, like if Bitcoin becomes anything, like like even a country, there is a potential for 100x growth. Okay? Even today, even after the crash. And the last part is that Bitcoin is mathematically very secure. But I talked about the tools that there aren't a lot of tools about. If there's one thing you would remember from this lecture, remember the name of this company. I'm not an investor. I'm, I'm not associated with them at all. Uh, it's called Coinbase. What they do is uh, they make buying Bitcoins extremely easy. And then they keep 97% of their assets printed on a piece of paper in Banks, which is kind of ironical. <laughs> so those bitcoins are actually not connected to any computer, so they cannot be stolen at all. Uh, so I, I won't get into like how to keep your bitcoins secure. Just go to Coinbase, you should be fine. Bitcoin's future. So I think I talked about this a lot. The 2014 is almost like 1994 uh, in terms of the internet. The blockchain, the file that we talked about, which gives you a distributed ledger, might actually be much more important than Bitcoin itself. So first I'm going to talk about just the currency aspects and then quickly go over the non-currency aspects. The currency aspects, this is a no-brainer, right? Sending money, so I've seen transactions on the Bitcoin network where someone was transferring $150 million with a transaction fee of 10 cents attached to it. So you can actually do that today. You can transfer $150 million or more from one country to another and pay no fees, almost no fees. This will happen in Western Union, like their business model is outdated, uh, and, and you know it's just a matter of time uh, before the takes over. Then there are different services that can be built on top. It doesn't cost you anything to have a big account, right? So, so think about other countries where it's hard, you have to sometimes get uh, approval from the government before you can even have a Bitcoin, have an account, have a bank account. Everyone gets a free account. It's like email now. Right? Everyone gets a free account. They can actually participate on the network. They can send money. They can receive it. You can have free escrow services. And you can actually have the internet money that, that was never there. It's, it's kind of like a funny thing that, you know, when you go to a website and it's not there, it gives you a HTTP 404 error. There was originally an error design saying, Oh, not enough money. So the original internet designers actually thought about having internet money built into the system, but they never actually got around to doing that. And Bitcoin does just that. For the first time, it's possible to, let's say, go to a page, and instead of seeing ads, you can just pay a fraction of a cent or something like that. You can load, let's say, $5 in your wallet, and every website, let's say you're, you want to view a New York Times article, and you're fine with paying like one-tenth of a cent, but they're getting 3 million users, so they can actually have a revenue model and not have to show you ads. So, so this uh, attacks the entire uh, online advertising uh, business. This is Bitcoin, but now I don't need banks. I can do transactions with no trusted third party. You can actually generalize this model. I can build something like Facebook, where there is no Facebook. All I'm doing is I'm giving Brian permissions to see my pictures without a trusted third party. The same model applies that you know, just like you don't need banks anymore with, with this new revolutionary technology, you don't need services like LinkedIn, Facebook, or any trusted third parties. And that is going to turn the internet upside down. Uh, this is actually something similar to what I'm working on uh, on the startup. It's called OneName.io. What we are doing is, with Bitcoin, you get a really secure private key that gives you access to your account that has all your money in it. What we do is that you get a very secure private key. 
that gives you access to a username, let's say my username is Muni, that it has all my data in it. So it's a more generic framework. In Bitcoin, the data only represents money. What we have built is the data can represent anything. It can represent digital assets. It can represent software licenses. It can represent pictures. It can represent you know, an online identity like Facebook. You can build like messaging app, apps on top. So it's, it's just a more generic protocol than Bitcoin itself. Uh, I wouldn't talk a lot about it, but you can actually go and check it out on onename.io. That's my profile. I think we open the questions.